Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. So the serpents spew water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Let's jump to verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and had testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, so here, says, say the, the woman just gave birth, and then Satan attacking uh, this woman. Uh, based on Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, you can look at it, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. It mentioned that Paul described himself as a woman giving uh, birth to a child. And because these people, the believers in Galatia, had departed from the truth, he said he had to go through once again the birth pain, okay, to, until these people have the, the uh, likeness of Christ. So the woman here, Paul described himself as a woman who gave birth. The, Satan attacked the worker first. And if it doesn't succeed, what happened? He attacked the offspring. Okay. So what does that tell us? It teaches us if you see uh, the worker got attacked, pray for them. Okay. But then we also need to pray for each other. If, he see, if he, I see you, I, if I overcome, I stand firm. I know that next, next talk is you, and I will have to pray for you. Okay. This is Satan. Satan attacks anybody he can defeat, but he usually attacks the, the, the head, the workers. Okay. Now, a while ago, last, uh, last period after the class, some people exp uh, asked ask me to explain more. Uh, why, what does it mean to, uh, what, judge Israel? Huh? Judging in this life, okay. Uh, let's turn to uh, Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation uh, chapter 20. Verse 4. Um, I'm sure that people have explained this to you before, right? Because it's going to take some time. I remember uh, a couple of years ago in the, on the, uh, the manna, the magazine manna, the church had published the TRC, Truth Research Committee, decided that chapter 20, verse 4. Uh, first, let me read it to you. It says, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on his forehead or on their heads. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay? So here we can see that there's a group of people sit on the throne, judge. It says here, verse 4, judgment was committed to them. Okay, they were judging. They were reigning with Christ as a king. And according to the, that's, I just want to let you know what church had decided, okay, TRC had decided, that the thousand year is the God's grace of period. God's period of grace is referred to now since the, since the establishment of the church, church the church. There's a salvation and whoever put God first, okay, they reign with Christ. And it says that they were, they were souls who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. That means they testify, and people hated them. The Bible says if you hate somebody, you actually commit murder, okay? It's not it's spiritually, it's not physically they got killed. It means spiritually they were hated, rejected by people when, when they preach, okay? But you know what? They still stand firm. They still follow God. As a result, they, fought, they reign with Christ. Okay? So if you know this interpretation uh, in, the, in the TRC, then you know that uh, when Jesus Christ said to the apostle, you judge the 12 tribe of Israel, it's not referred to after life. Apostle who, the apostle put Christ first. They also, just like this verse, they reign with Christ. Did I explain to you clearly? Is it clear? No. Oh, judging. Yeah, 
the judging means pastor. I said judging. Uh, so sometimes we think judging say right and wrong, right and wrong. Okay, fine. It's just more than right and wrong. But after we tell them right and wrong, we kind of tell them what to do. Okay. Any questions? Yes, brother Joe. Rain. Yes. Yeah, judging means pastoring. Okay? Yes, Rebecca? Okay. Uh, I'm talking about Revelation chapter 20. Okay, the 1,000 year reign referred to Chuji Church, not apostolic, not apostolic, because that time apostolic already established. Let's talk about the future. Okay, the white horse appear, starting from white horse appear. Okay, and if you want to know more detail about white horse, everything, no, white horse, but about Book of Revelation, I think um, in NYTS, some people teach you Revelation, right? Yeah, ask that person, okay? Uh, I'm not here to teach Revelation. <laughs> There's too, too many things to talk about, okay? But I'm just trying to use that to, to illustrate what does it mean to reign with Christ, okay? All right, let's go back to um, uh, fourth vision. So are we finished with uh, one to seven? Uh, this one, something I want to add. So what one, one to seven to, is telling us? It's telling us that we should be holy, put God first. Holy mean we belong to God. And in the book of Haggai, chapter two, verse 10 to 14, God also kind of tell Haggai, say, you gotta tell the people, you know, these people serve me with uncleanness. Right? God doesn't like it. For example, let me ask you a question. If you go to a restaurant, you see the waitress, right? A waiter, go to the bathroom. They didn't wash their hands. Okay, and then they serve you with dishes. How do you feel? They put, the, they put their hands on the dish and they hand it to you. How do you feel? You say, well, uh, thank you for serving me, but <laughs> Uh, you kind of put off, right? But same thing with us today, okay? If we do not serve in God's way, God doesn't like it. Other people may not like, may not like it too. For example, if I serve, serve in a selfish way, okay? When I serve you, okay? Some people, I say. Some people, if some people serve you, they do you a favor, they do something for you, but it's a favor, okay? You owe me, okay? Let's say, you owe to that person. So, by the way they look at you, say, I do this for you. Remember, pay me back. So the more they serve you, how do you feel? Oh, this is too much. I owe you too much. I don't know. Please don't serve me anymore. Okay? You give me a burden. Okay? So that's not the way God wants us to serve. Sometimes we serve in an arrogant way or serve in a selfish way, whatever. God does not like it. It's like, you're not doing it for me. I don't like it. It's just like somebody put his unclean hand on the plate. We, we don't like it, okay? So we got to serve in God's way and follow God's command. I mean to love the Lord our God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength, okay? So this is from verse one to verse seven. Oh, by the way, forgot to tell you, uh, verse seven, we haven't gone to the last part. If we, if we follow God's way and keep God's command, what will happen to us? First, uh, chapter 3, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7. It says, then you shall also judge my house. It means what? The high priest can serve in the temple, right? Take care of the, the people at that time. For us, is we can take care of the brothers and sisters, okay? Second, likewise, have charge of my court. Charge is referred to responsibility. This responsibility is honorable. Is glorious. Paul say, I have this treasure in this clay jar. This treasure referred to the ministry, his responsibility. He considered it as a treasure. Next one says, I will give you places to walk among these who are who stand here. Where are the places? Refer here, the places around to walk among these. Who are these who stand here? 
was here before God, before the Lord. And these means there are some people who are holy. They are also able to stand before the Lord too. Okay, and what's so important to us? Because in Hebrews chapter six, verse uh, Hebrews chapter four, verse sixteen. Let's turn to that, please. Hebrews chapter four, verse sixteen. Hebrews chapter four, verse sixteen. The main point of high priest, right? The function of high priest is to intercede, uh, to pray, and God answer. If God does not answer, then there's no point of praying. And Hebrew chapter four, verse sixteen says, "Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need." Okay, so if we are holy, we can come before God to the throne of grace and request God, and God grant our request. And that's what's so significant about being priests. Because we're always interceding for people, and we're also praying for uh, ourselves too. So um, this is uh, the blessing that we have. We can come before the throne of grace. Any questions about one to seven? If not, let's go to second part, verse eight to uh, verse ten. Now, yesterday your counselor gave you the assignment, right? Did they tell you uh, what this? Do you have to do this? Did they tell you you had to do the stone? No. Okay, it's okay. Uh, tell me, uh, what does the stone represent here? Jesus. How do you know? Seven eyes, because it's the seven eyes. Okay, what what is what are seven eyes represent? Huh? Huh? All seen. Okay. Mm, okay. Okay. Let's uh, go one at a time. Okay. First, verse eight. <clears throat> this is what God showed to um, Joshua, the high priest, and his companion. Okay, for they are one. They are wonder sign. They are a wonder sign. Referred to verse eight, and verse nine. Okay, what God is showing them. For I bring forth my servant, the branch. Now, what does it mean branch? Why, why is the Lord call him branch? Branch means something sprouted, and in this, in um, in Old Testament, the word branch, right? Sometimes is capitalized, sometimes not, by same word. And in this in this context, the printer like to print it as capitalized in every every letter. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter twenty-three, verse five, that's what branch means. Well, why it called branch? Let's look at it. I, I, Jeremiah chapter twenty-three, verse five. Jeremiah chapter twenty-three, verse five. Twenty-three, verse five. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper, and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth.、Uh, God promised David that he shall never fail a man to sit on the throne as a king. And that is saying that in the future, one of David's descendants shall become king forever. And that's why in verse five, God said, "I will raise to David a branch. A branch means what came from David, a descendant of David." And a king shall reign and prosper. Mean that this person, the branch, descendant of David, will will be the king. Okay. So、um, in verse eight, let's come back, turn back to Zechariah chapter three, verse eight. First,、um, Lord Jesus,、uh, God said, "I am bringing forth my servant, the branch." It means that a descendant of David will come to become king. That's number one. Second, for behold, the stone. Uh, we have to use Bible to explain Bible. Okay,、uh, the stone is Jesus Christ. How do we know? First Peter chapter two verse five. Please turn to First Peter chapter two verse five. First Peter chapter two verse five. First Peter chapter two verse five. 
chapter 2, verse 5. To verse 6. First, first Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Well, start from verse 4 then. Start from verse 4, 4 to 6. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, and precious, verse 5. You also as living stone are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, a light precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Verse 4 tells us that him, if we refer to Jesus, a living stone. Uh, verse 6 tells us he's a cornerstone. And who are we? We are also the living stone too, built upon this cornerstone, okay? building up to become a temple for God to dwell. Okay? And we are the priesthood. We serve in the temple. So in here, since it's talk about the priesthood, God showed him the stone, the cornerstone. What's the what's cornerstone? It's the first stone that you, you put when you build the house. Uh, the cornerstone is important because the direction that the stone, how the stone was put, will determine the direction of the house. For example, okay, if you put straight, then the next, the next block of stone, right, need to next to the stone, the first stone. So you, you align the stone, every, all the stone with the first stone, one by one, based on the first stone, okay. And if the first stone is this thick, then the second stone has to be this thick too, or else the foundation is not even. So the first stone is very, very important, okay? And what's the last stone? Later on you'll read, it's called capstone. And you, you finish it. Capstone, it means the last stone that you put on the building. It's called capstone, yeah. So the God said, this is stone, okay? And this stone has what? Seven eyes. Uh, let's look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. What are seven eyes represent? Uh, sometimes we interpret as all-knowing. All That's correct, too. Okay? Uh, but I'd like to show you what's in, what the Bible says. Okay? Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Can somebody read? Next. Okay, thank you. So here it says, And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. God's a spirit, but here it's mentioned seven spirits. Seven is being complete. Okay? And it's referred to the spirit of God. So what it's saying is prophesies this king, this branch from the descendant of David, okay? He shall be like a stone or a cornerstone, okay? Very important, determined. And also we'll build a house. Later on you'll read, we'll, we'll build a house. And with the seven eyes means spirit of God on him. That's what I mean, with the spirit of God will be on him, okay? Now, I'd like to share with you Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. The Spirit of God. There were seven eyes. The seven, the eye, the seven eyes. What are, what are the characteristics of the Spirit of God? The seven eyes. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Uh, here it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Okay, so here describe what effects does it have when the Spirit descends upon him. Okay, why I'm showing you this? Because we also need to have this characteristic too. We also receive the Holy Spirit. 
okay? And it's just a matter of we submit to, to the word of God, not question the Holy Spirit or not, okay? Uh, let's also look at what, what are the manifestations in our lives if we have spirit of God. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah chapter 61, 1 to 3. Can I uh, pass the microphone to... Oh, okay. Go ahead. Verse 1, 2, one. 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. 3. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Okay, thank you. So here it mentioned, uh, actually the Lord quoted this passage too, chapter 61, verse 1. Uh, in the book of Luke, he mentioned that he read this Isaiah, and he said this passage uh, fulfill before your eyes. So this passage is referred to Lord Jesus Christ. But also this refers to us too, because we also have the Spirit of God. And we ought to be like Lord Jesus Christ, preach good news to the poor, okay? Heal the brokenhearted. Know how to comfort people with the Word of God, okay? And know how to set people free, okay? How to tell them how to be liberated, okay? From it, okay? And also tell God's favor, uh, acceptable year of the Lord. I mean, this is the time of salvation. And also what? Tell, telling them God's judgment in the future. Okay. Verse 3, to console those who mourn in Zion. Uh, those who mourn in Zion means not Gentile, refer to believers. Zion refer to the church. Okay. There are people who are sad because either they are overcome by uh, trouble or um, how do you say it? Something bad happened to them or they're bounded by sin, whatever. Okay. And to give them beauty for ashes. The beauty referred to like Jesus Christ. Okay. Not sin. Okay. Or a, or a joy. Uh, means filled with spirit of God, filled with joy. Okay. Delighted in their faith. Uh, garment of praise. Um, instead of uh, spirit heaviness, okay? And this is the work, whoever has the Holy Spirit, uh, that's what we need to do, okay? So th the Lord Jesus Christ did all these things, okay? And we ought to be like him. Now, um, and then another characteristic is, I will engrave his inscription in verse nine. The word engrave means, it's not writing in the sand, it's engraved on a stone. What God means is he will never change it. This is God's will for this person, for this stone. And this stone shall do one thing. God determined it. He said what? I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. What's that day? The day that Jesus Christ crucified. The day Lord Jesus Christ said, my God, my God, why, why you have forsaken me? That's the time that he bears the sins of people. Okay. Now, finally, verse 10. This is a little hard. Uh, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Now the question is, what does that mean? Can somebody, okay. What does that mean? Uh, sounds good, but my house doesn't have a vine tree, vine or fig tree. This, this passage is quoting from 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. It's using that analogy, using that verse to illustrate something. Let's turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. First Kings chapter 4, verse 25. First Kings chapter 4, verse 25. Chapter 4, verse 25. 
and Judah and Israel dwell safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Okay. This is the first time Bible records when Solomon reigns, right? Use the description that everybody was under their fig tree or vine. It's a picture of prosperity. It's a picture of peace. And Solomon is actually the anointed one because what? He was a king of Israel. He was anointed to become king. He was anointed. He's a king. And this king gave them peace. Okay? So let's go back to Zechariah chapter 3, verse 10. Remember, we talk about verse 9, verse, uh, verse 8 and 9, right? A descendant of David who would become king. And then what? He will remove the sin in one day. And when that happened, it says in that day, which day? Christ removed the sin. Christ reigned on, in heaven. Okay? We, uh, the, the apostle, were later on were baptized. And today we are baptized too. When we are baptized, we're actually in the reign of Christ. Okay? Some of, some of you maybe do not have experience, but some of you may have experience when they do so much wrongdoing, they suffer so much. When they come to church and heard the gospel and they were baptized, some people testify. They feel like the burden suddenly on their shoulder disappear. They have a burden, invisible burden. After baptism, they feel so light, so joyful. Okay, oftentimes I baptize people. After they get out from the water, they're all smiling Don't, for no reason, just always smiling. And later on, they told me they feel so light. Why are they smiling? I mean, nothing happened. It's supposed to be more heavy. You know, all the water on the clothes is heavier than before. And nothing happened, too. They just came out. But they're all smiling because, you know what? It's a sense of removal of way. We would tend to smile quite often. So if, I, if you look at my face, I always like so sad or poker face. Or if I look at your face, boring face, burden face, that means what? Maybe we, we have sin. You see, when people have so much sin, even though something good things happen, they cannot be joyful. Don't know why, just they cannot be joyful. But you know what? Kids, you know, infants, they don't know a lot. They don't commit too much sin. And nothing happened, they're always smiling. Okay, some things happen, they're always smiling. They're very joyful. How about us? Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, Christ, after the, the day that Christ died for our sin, okay, everybody who received water baptism, we're actually in the reign of Christ, live in peace spiritually. However, some of you may say, no, I don't feel it. Uh, my sins are washed away. I, I was baptized, my sins are washed away. But I don't feel the peace. In my life, there are so many troubles, turmoil, suffering, sadness. I don't feel it, the reign of Christ. And i tell you why. Okay? Besides being baptized into the church, have, having the sins washed away, in New Testament, okay, the kingdom of God is not just say God is reigning and I, and I on earth. Remember, I show you Revelation chapter twenty verse four, right? We reign with Christ one thousand years. So in New Testament, apostle and us, it's not just like hanging around of oh, Christ reigning and just his citizen. No, Bible tells us we reign with Christ. So in order to, re to really experience the reign of Christ, we had to what? Reign with Christ also. Put God first. And we shall truly experience the peace in the kingdom of God. Any questions about this? So not just baptism, wash your sins away, but the whole context about high, what God asked the high priest to do. Keep my ways, obey my commandments, command. 
This is the way to have peace, to experience the kingdom of God. So the choice is ours. Uh, let's, I'll actually share with you a verse. Let's turn to uh, uh, Hebrew chapter 1, verse 9. I was going to mention later, but I decided to mention now to you. Hebrew chapter 1, verse 9. Do you know why some people, when they pray, they experience a lot more than others? Some people pray, nothing happened. Why? Let's read, read Hebrew chapter 1, verse 9. It says here, you have loved righteousness and hated lawless, lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Okay. The oil of gladness referred to the Holy Spirit. And why some people, refer, why this person received more than others? Because that person loved righteousness and hated, hated lawlessness. Love righteousness. Righteousness means do what is right in the eyes of God. And what God wants to do is put him first. Do you love to put God first or not? Do we love to put God first or not? Sometimes people put God first because they have to, so that the problem can be solved. That is not love, but that's good. At least you try, try to force yourself to put God first, okay? But we should be what? Love to put God first. There's a difference, right? Love means you don't need to tell me. I will do it. You know what? I'll do it all the time. But if we had to force ourselves to put God first. It's like, I try to remind myself. I keep forgetting it. It's something I always forget. It's something like, I. What, what do we always forget? Maybe it's because we don't care that much. If we care so much, will you forget? Or do we have to force ourselves? No. So we have to reach the point we love righteousness. We love to put God first, not forcing ourselves. And how do we do that? How do we do that? Brother and sister, I want to mention to you, some of you, or a lot of us, raised up in an environment that our parents say, on Sabbath, you gotta go to church. You got to, okay? And so we are kids, we have no choice. But then some people, once they uh, become college students, they live outside, they start to say, why do I need to listen to my parents? I have something else better to do, like for example, fun, games, my friends. Why do I need to go to church? So that power, the restraining power, that the power to tell us to go to church, it started gradually fading. At this time, it's important that we need to develop faith of our own. It's we love to go to church. It's not because my parents tell me to go to church. And why I want to go to church is because I love God. God loves me. I experience the love of God. God has done so much things for us. And we really, we don't think about it that often. Please think about how much God loves us on the Sabbath day, in, in church too, in daily life. You see, Paul said he lived for Christ because what? The love com compels him. The love of Christ compels him not because his parents or somebody have a stick and say, go, love God. We tend to force ourselves, that's good. We need that for the, for the beginning. For example, we always say, Jason, I said, I said to myself in the past, okay, Jason, you gotta go to church, you gotta love God, or else you go to hell. So I almost like I have a gun, I imagine I have a gun pointing in my head, you gotta love God, okay, or I'll go to hell, okay, okay, okay. And then, you know, after a couple of years and sometimes after a couple of months, I'm tired of loving God. I'm growing, it's like tired. I do all these things. Sometimes we're so tired, we just say, 
I don't want love of God. Shoot me then. Okay, I want to have fun. I want to do whatever I want. Okay. So that doesn't work. I mean, it worked for some times. It's good. But we need to, in our faith, we need to not keep forcing ourselves. But there's a greater power. That greater power is when we know the love of Christ. We experience the love of Christ. People do anything for love, don't you think? There are some people, they die because of love. They sacrifice themselves because of love. That love is much greater than the power of telling ourselves, you got to do this or else go to hell. So we got to start pursue and know how much Christ loves us so that we will love to do righteousness. Not like, oh, I had to do this. I had to put God first. All right? So time's up. Let's sing a hymn. Uh, let's sing him. I put God first in my life, 380.